Good morning, everybody, and Sabbath blessings to you. I'm coming to you live and in full Technicolor from Gravenhurst, Ontario, which is where I'm residing right now. Uh, just to give you a bit of history, because there's a number of you out there who, who don't know me. Um, let me see if I can get rid of this on my screen. There we go. Um, uh, I've been, well, I've been connected with the Bronte Seventh-day Adventist Church for over 27 years. Uh, me, my wife, Janice, my son, Spencer, and my daughter, Michaela, uh, went, to Bronte, went to Bronte for some uh, 15 years. We, uh, we didn't leave. We didn't leave. We did move. Um, we did move and we were back and forth. We moved to Seaforth, Ontario, and uh, now we're going to be moving to Stratford. So hopefully, once we make that move, um, we'll be uh, we'll be visiting Bronte a little bit more often, and we'll be you know we'll be we'll be back there hopefully at least a couple of times uh, a couple of times a month anyway. So that's just a little bit of history of, uh, of who I am. So uh, I am very familiar with uh, with the Bronte Church, and a special hello to everyone who who I do know, uh, Jimmy and everyone else, Cheryl and all the other people, Yvonne. Um, but we do miss you. We do miss the Bronte Church. It's been uh, quite a while. I was at Bronte uh, just short of two years ago. That was the last time I was there. Uh, Pastor Zama had actually just uh, just come to Bronte, and uh, I was there to uh, to preach. So it's it's been a while, and we do miss you. But you know, we will be back. Uh, hopefully, come the winter, we'll be back be back a little bit more often. Um, these are uh, these are strange times uh, that we're living in, and. Um, the message that I want to want to uh, talk about today, or the um, the emphasis, is that number one, God is in control. God is in control, and number two, we all have a part in this, and that's something that we cannot lose face of. We cannot lose um, lose that momentum. We have uh, something to do here uh, in these times. There's something that I want to uh, that I want to share with you. Many of you who might be uh, historians or history buffs, uh, none of this is going to, su to surprise you. Uh, for some of you, some of these facts I'm about, I'm about to read may surprise you a little bit. Um, back in 1346, actually from 1346 to 1351, the world went through a time known as the Black Plague or the Black Death, and millions of people lost their lives uh, during that time. Uh, not too, too long. Well, 500 years later, as a matter of fact, 1918 to 1920, we went through a time known as the Spanish flu. Millions of people lost their lives at that time because of the Spanish flu. Then in 1910, a phenomenon known as Halley's Comet, which was a huge boulder, basically, that was flying through space. Halley's Comet was coming and was going to collide with the Earth. And of course, that was going to be the end of the Earth. Um, since then, the same thing has happened twice since, uh, since 1910. We're still here. World Wars I and II, the year 2000, and the Y2K scare. What was going to happen then? And of course, everybody probably remember this one, the end of the Mayan calendar in 2012. That also was a scare. And today, of course, with what we're going through with COVID-19. All of these events, events, all of these events had us, uh, had many literary people, had many scholars, had many Bible scholars, had many ministers writing letters, writing documents, saying that this was the second coming of Jesus. This was the end times and Christ coming was there. Christ coming was happening was about to happen. And of course, Christ has not come yet. His second coming has not happened yet. Now, here, here's the question everybody asks, and it's a legitimate question. Are we living in the end times? Are we living in the last days? Now, the answer, according to scripture, the answer is, is quite easy to figure out. If we simply look in the book of Matthew, in chapter 24, and verses three to thirteen, and this is this is a lot. This is a lot to swallow all at once. But if you look at the book, the book of Matthew, chapter twenty-four, and we start at verse three, and this is how it reads: Now, now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples asked him, that's Jesus, privately, tell us when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, and of the end of the age. For a lot of this, this is simply review. 
And Jesus answered, and he said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, which is diseases, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, uh, will be betraying one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because of lawlessness, will be, it will abound. The love of many will grow cold. But to, to, but to he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now that's, that's a lot to swallow. That's, that's a lot to take in. But when you, just, when you listen to those scriptures and describe what we're going through in the world today, People ask themselves, are we living in the last days? And the answer can only be yes. There is only one logical answer. Are we living in towards the end of time? Yes, we are. Now, here's the rub. And here's the important part. People are also asking, is Christ coming? Is Christ coming now? Christ coming is imminent. And by that, I mean Christ's coming is probably far, far nearer than any of us really believe or any of us really know. Christ's coming is imminent. Christ's coming is a sure thing. Everything Christ did, Christ was a lot of things, but Christ was no liar. And everything that he said, everything that he preached was truth. He said he was going to come and take us home. And so he will. It's a sure thing. That is how our time on this earth is going to end. No question. No argument. It's not going to be through war. It's not going to be through a nuclear bomb, although there may be damage done by someone setting off a nuclear bomb, but it's not going to end the world. There is only one way that our time on this earth will end, and that is with the glorious and wonderful second coming of Jesus. And let's remember, let's not use this as a threat. This is not something to throw in people's faces in order to make them fearful that they must come to God and come to God now, to make them be fearful of a God who is going to destroy them, a God who is going to zap them with the lightning bolt. That's, that's not God. That's not the God that we love. That's not the God who created us. The God who created us is an ever-loving God and an ever-patient God. He is the God who created us purely out of love. He created this world. And at the end of that creation, he all of a sudden turned around and he formed man and formed woman and breathed his very own breath into them and they became living souls. Why? Because he wanted to love us. He wanted to be worshiped. He wanted to be God. So he created us. So in the second coming, the second coming of Jesus is a wonderful, wonderful thing. It is not something to be used to try to scare people into a love of God. That, that's not what God wants. God does not want us to worship him because we are afraid of him. The Bible tells us to fear God. That's to respect. God wants us to be respected. He wants us to, of course he does. He created us. He created us for that respect, for that love, to have that one-on-one -on -one relationship with each and every one of us. And that is how we should approach Christ's second coming. It is a glorious thing. It is a wonderful thing. It is everlasting life. Can you imagine what's going to happen to you? Think of this personally, 
all right? Whenever you're, do, whenever you're studying the Bible, whenever you're studying scripture, whenever you're studying actions in scripture and what we must, must go through and the Holy Spirit working with us, we have to personalize it. We have to put ourselves into the picture and say, this is me. Because Jesus looks at us and says, I am with you. I am with you personally. I know you. I want to know you more. I want to bless you. I want to love you. I want to make an impact in your life. I want to make a difference in the way that you live and in the way that you think. And it's all possible. It's all good. With God, with Christ, there is no negative. Think about it. Everything in your relationship with Christ, in your relationship with your Heavenly Father, is all positive. It's all good. Do, do bad things happen to you? You're like, yes, but God sees you through. God is there. God is there to strengthen you. God is there to encourage you. This is what the second coming is all about. It's a great, glorious thing in which the dead in Christ rise first at Jesus' coming, and those who are alive and have him in their hearts go up second. But let's back up. Let's back up just a little bit before the second coming. Because this is the most important, for me anyway, this is the most important part of that scripture about the end times. It says in verse 13, Matthew 24, verse 13, we just read it. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Okay, this is for us. This is for us. This is God saying to us, you know what? Yes, the end times are going to come. And yes, we're very, very well living in them now. You've got a part in this. You have a part in this. My gospel is to be spread to every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every part of the world. We're not there yet. You look at the statistics. We're not quite there yet. There are small areas of this world who do not have the gospel yet, and there are some countries in this world who don't have the gospel, don't have the gospel simply because of their politics and because of the, because of the way that area is run. They won't allow it. There are, there are countries that, that do that. Some of you may be from those countries. You may have come from a country where you, you, can't, you can't get the Bible. You can't find the Bible, let alone preach it. So there's still work that we have to do. And that is a wonderful thing because you are involved in that. I don't know where you are in your relationship with God. You're here on the Zoom with the Bronte Church. So I'm going to assume that all of you are on a Christian journey. All of you are taking part right now in a Christian journey. That started somewhere. That Christian journey for you started somewhere. I don't know. I, I don't know how. I do have some ideas on how it started. You may have heard something on the radio. You may have seen something on TV. You know, that's one of the great ways in which the gospel is being spread to this world is through our incredible communication abilities now with satellite and telecommunications. In that way, the Bible is being spread faster than it ever has been. So you may have found out that way, but still. Even today, the number one most positive way and most popular way that people learn about the love of God and come into a relationship with him, or at least start in a relationship with him, is through personal contact, through someone that they know, through a relative, through a friend, through a colleague, through someone that they just happen to meet. And there, in there, that is where our part comes in. There are many, many people out there. Please do not fool yourself. There are many, many people out there who are just waiting for the opportunity to have the kind of relationship with God that you have. That's right, you. 
the very kind of relationship you have, there are people in your circle who long for that kind of thing. They long for seeing why you are the way you are. And that's the greatest thing that you can be to a person is to show that love for God. Have you ever heard the, have you ever heard of the expression, I have heard a lot of lousy sermons, but I have seen a lot of great ones. The best sermons aren't heard. They are seen. They are acted. It's the way that people carry themselves. It's the way that people act. It's the support that they give. It's the compassion that they show. It's the love that they have for their friends or for their relatives, whoever that person may be. There's the saying, love ridiculously. I've heard one minister say that, actually, in, in California. That's what his church is all about. He tells people in his church that you're going to experience two things, especially in the days in which we live now. Number one, you are going to be loved and loved ridiculously. You're going to be loved so much that you can't help but come back here. But number two, and probably most importantly, you are going to learn about the love of God and the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Because that is what we are all about. The Seventh Day Adventist Church has the Advent right in its name. That's how important this event is to us in time. Advent being the second coming of Christ, how important it is. But the, but the aspect of it, the main point of the second coming of Christ is what happens just before it. And that's us. That's us taking action, being the kind of people that God has tried to make us, being better people each and every day, being loving and compassionate and empathetic and having a kind word for people. This is not the time, and please understand what I'm saying here. This is not the time to go around telling people how wrong they may be, or how wrong their religion may be, or that they go to church on the wrong day, or that they're not vegetarian, whatever it may be. This is not the time for such things as that. This is a time for showing and living God's love. So you can have that kind of an impact on other people. Because once they see that and they decide, oh, there's something here. There's something here that I have to learn about. And they decide that they want to have a part of this relationship too. And they start their own personal relationship with God. That's the key. One on one them and God, you and God in your personal relationship. Then and only then do changes start taking place in your life through the work of the Holy Spirit working on the heart that do you see change, do changes start in that person. You can tell a person to keep Sabbath until you're blue in the face. You can tell people to return tithe until they're blue in the face. Until they have, they experience that loving, heartfelt, continual relationship with God. That love that keeps them coming back and coming back and coming back every, every single day. Because you want to have a daily relationship with God, not just every Sabbath. You want to have it every day. <coughs> and then the changes mean something. Because they know why. There's a reason behind this. And the main reason has to be because I love my God. It has to be because God is working in my heart. It can't be because of a threat. It can't be because somebody says, oh, you're going to be damned if you don't. You're going to burn in hell. I was told that, but I won't get into that. Anyhow, so that, that is the importance of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And as far as knowing when Jesus is going to come, it doesn't matter, does it? It doesn't matter to us. 
We are saved by one thing and one thing only. We are not saved. And I've heard a person tell this to me just a couple of months ago when I was talking to him. We we're talking about the times that we're living in and we're talking about the second coming of Jesus. And then he said something very strange to me that I never heard before. And he said, it's okay. When Jesus comes, I'll be saved. And I looked at him and he could tell that, you know, the wheels were, the wheels were spinning. And he said, what's wrong? And I said, well, you know, I love you, brother. I do. But at Jesus, the saving starts now. The saving grace of Jesus Christ, that is what you are saved by. We are saved by accepting Jesus into our hearts, allowing the Holy Spirit to work with us, accepting him as Lord and Savior. We are saved. We are saved by the grace of Jesus Christ and that alone. That starts now. Do not get the idea that I can wait, I can wait, I can wait. The love starts now. The love that we show to people starts now. Eternal life by grace through Jesus Christ starts now. Eternal life starts now. It may be disrupted for a while through, through our death if we die before Jesus comes. But that, that's just a pause. That's just a sleep. That's just a pause until Jesus comes, and then Jesus comes, and it continues. So start living your eternal life now. Start loving other people eternally now. Your actions speak far, speak far, far louder than your words do. And how do you do this? Well, God is going to provide you with opportunity. He always has. He always will. He always does. All of us will have opportunity to touch people in our lives. It is inevitable. It's unavoidable. We are in contact with people every single day. And simply by the way that we act, the way that we speak, the compassion that we show. Now, Jesus was followed by a mob. You, you, you read it chapter after chapter in the Gospels. Jesus was going somewhere and he's followed by a big mob. Because people just wanted to hear him and see him. Well, let's try to do let, let's try to do the same thing. When we do have those opportunities of talking with friends or with relatives or whoever it is, show that kindness, show that compassion, show that love. When Jesus healed the blind man, when he healed him, before he healed him, before he healed him was actually the more important event than the actual healing. Because before he healed him, his disciples, who still weren't sure at this time what Jesus was all about, they really weren't. They said to Jesus, who's to blame for this man's blindness, him or his parents? Who sinned? Who did wrong? Who do we blame because of this? And Jesus looked at them and said, no one is to blame. Because you have to remember, in that day, and put this into context, we all have, always have to put our scripture into context. In the context of, of that day, many people thought that way. Many people thought if, chi if children were born and something was wrong, it was because the parents had sinned. They'd committed a great sin, and God was punishing them. Old world thinking, right? God punishing you for doing something bad. So they punished your son or your daughter, and the person is born, bl born blind. So there's someone to blame. There's someone at fault for this. Well, Jesus looked at them and said, no one is to blame. Neither him nor his parents sinned to cause his blindness. The next verse is the most important. It is so the glory of God can be shone through that this man was born blind. This man is born blind because he is going to show people the grace and the love, and the imminence, and the heartfoundness of a loving God. And of course, Jesus then, Jesus did not just point at him, touch him, and give him a sight back. Jesus told him what to do to gain his sight back. And that boy, without question, followed Jesus 
instruction. And his sight was given back. We have to take a lesson from that. Jesus gives us instruction. Things do not happen from in, in the blink of an eye. Things do not happen at the snap of a finger. But Jesus has given us instruction. And the instruction is the two great commandments. And you think about those two great commandments, and you think about the time in which we're living, living today. And that, of course, is found in Matthew 22 and verse 37. And Jesus is asked in verse 36, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answered to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. The second is of equal value. The second means something too. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That first commandment covers the first four of loving our God and respecting our God. And the second commandment covers the last six of man respecting man, man loving man, man meaning something to man. Think about it. Is that not where we are right now? Think about the things that are happening in this world with COVID and the other uprisings and the protests. Push a button and stop it for a second. Push a button and stop what you're seeing on the news for just a second. Push a button and stop what you're seeing on social media for just a second. And ask yourself, Number one, would this be going on right now if everybody had a loving relationship with the living God? Would this be happening right now if everyone had a loving and saving relationship with Jesus Christ? And then ask yourself one more question. Would this be happening if everybody respected one another? and treated one another as they would want to be treated themselves. And see what the world would be like then. God has given us the answer. The answer to the, the issues that we have and the problems that we have are really, really quite simple. But to a lot of people, well, unfortunately, it just doesn't matter. Because sin and selfishness and pride and a number of other things have all played into this over the, over the past many thousands of years. Man makes his own decisions, and that is a God-given right. God gave us free will as part of his perfect plan, because God was not going to make us a bunch of robots. God wanted us to come to him in love, not in fear. He wants us to come to him because we love him. And because we want to live as he would have us live. He, we want to be as he have us be. It'd be much a different world, wouldn't it? I just want to close with this thought. All through scripture, there is what I call good scripture and positive scripture. And there's other scripture where it's tough to read. And it's tough to, tough to famine. But all scripture, all scripture, not just some of them, but all scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, all scripture leads back to Jesus Christ. He is the be all and the end all. All scripture is written by a loving God whose whole idea is love, love for his children. Love for his planet. Translate that into your own life. All of us have wonderful, wonderful experiences that we go through. I hope that one of them is your continual Christian journey with your Savior. 
All of us go through the bad times. All of us go through the hard times. But just remember, as God's children, as Christ as your Savior in your life with him, all of your events don't get stuck in the middle because they all end or they all point to, they all lead to Jesus Christ. So everything in your life leads back to Jesus Christ. God is in control and God will remain in control. Christ said to us, I'm here to bring you life and life more abundantly. And Jesus has the last word for all of us. Jesus has the last word and that word is life. Life more abundantly and life everlasting. May God bless you all. Thank you so much for inviting me today to, uh, to share this message with you. And I hope to see you all soon in person. Very, very soon. God bless. Thank you, Jerry. Do you mind just having a benediction, please? Sure. Our loving Heavenly Father. Father, you are such a privilege. You are always there. And you always will be. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. And soon, and very soon, your kingdom will come with Jesus coming. We look forward to that time, dear Father. Give us right hearts. Give us right attitudes. Give us that love, dear Father, that so many, many people need to share and need to have a part of. In these days, dear Father, may we keep our eyes upon you, our thoughts upon you, but also upon our fellow man. Help us to be there for our fellow man as you would have us be. And may we have that great and wonderful peace that only comes from you. We thank you and we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen.